Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. City Council members raising the possibility of big reforms in the San Antonio Police Department today. In the shadow of ongoing protests, the police chief and top city staff briefed city council members this afternoon about various issues with the police department. Garrett Berger has been keeping an eye on this meeting. So Garrett, what have you been hearing about these so far? Well, definitely a lot of support for change, though what that means specifically still to be determined. Council members got an earful from Black Lives, supporter, Black Lives Matter supporters last week during a council meeting, and some have been out at the demonstrations. During a meeting today, some raised their own ideas for reform. Now, we heard some talk about budget priorities, which has come up before, but Sh Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez also asked if top police officials need to be law enforcement officers. City staff say they do. She suggested changing the leadership, uh, le how the leadership works might be needed if they want real reform. And Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan called for repealing state laws that govern the hiring and discipline process for officers and the San Antonio police's ability to form a union. Local voters could petition to get those issues on a ballot. Now, according to information from the city, if a city adopted neither one of those state codes or a civil service by charter, the officers would be under the state and federal employment laws that generally apply to public employees. I ask that the city of San Antonio continue to let their voices be heard and to go to ensuring that this petition to repeal things that have been done prior to any of us being alive. Now, in his comments, the police chief also focused on a need to reform the disciplinary process, which is controlled by one of those state codes and the union contract. The chief also talked about the eight can't wait campaign, a campaign that pushes policies it says would decrease killings by police. Now, the chief believes the department meets all the policies in that campaign, even if it doesn't get if it only gets credit for about half of them, he said he would continue to work on that in that area. Now, the Public Safety Committee is also expected to hold a series of community listening sessions later this month to hear what changes the public wants to see. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Garrett. The current collective bargaining agreement for San Antonio police officers expires in a little over a year. And while some city officials attempted to address officer discipline during the last series of negotiations, the final contract that was signed in 2016 focused on overhauling health care payments for officers and their families. This time around, discipline will likely be at the forefront of discussions. The local government code sets baseline rules for police and fire departments in Texas and allows those departments to organize and negotiate enhancements, often called a collective bargaining agreement. SAPD Chief William McManus says he has an issue with how those are working for discipline. Conduct must be certain and, and they must be final. If they're not, we get police officers back on the department that need to be fired. San Antonio leads the country the past decade in terms of fired officers being reinstated. That has happened more than 67% of the time. The case at Defender Special Broken Blue takes a deep dive into police misconduct and discipline within the San Antonio Police Department. We've had it available to view on demand on the KSAT TV app and KSAT.com, but we are showing it again over the air this Friday night at 7 right here on KSAT 12. I want to go live to Sky 12 right now. The day after George Floyd was laid to rest in Houston, protests and demonstrations continue around the country. Sky 12 right now over protesters who are on the move marching for racial justice. Aside from a few incidents, the protests here in the Alamo City have been very peaceful. At one point, this was taking place outside of the Bear County Courthouse. I believe they marched over to the Bear County Jail, and then now they are making their way back to the courthouse as you see a number gathering right now. But again, this has been a peaceful protest. It was six, the Bear County Courthouse complex about to reopen after a shutdown of almost three months because of COVID-19. For criminal courts, reopening is a major, often complex process. Paul Venema takes us into the civil courts where it's a surprisingly different story. State district courts, probate courts, and the children's court are the major tenants here. From civil lawsuits to divorce, child custody cases, and probate matters, it was a busy place until COVID-19 hit. It was a devastating impact 
on our whole entire justice system. Judge Peter Sakai is the senior judge of the 14 judges who preside in civil district courts. When the pandemic hit, he and his colleagues were forced to quickly embrace the concept of working remotely. We're probably about 60 to 70 percent capacity of what we were hearing. We're basically back on and all 14 civil district court judges are hearing cases remotely. That means no parking problems or waiting in courthouse hallways, a much smoother, more efficient way of working for everyone involved. They can just log on to their computers and participate in their civil case by Zoom, and that has been a game changer. Judges here do have one thing in common with their criminal court counterparts. We have a backlog in the sense of uh, responding to attorneys who are asking for hearings. But come Monday, it'll be a whole new world in this old building. The old school of coming to the courthouse may be going away for the civil side of the courthouse. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. Did you know that in the 1860s, during the Civil War era, black Union soldiers in Louisiana developed a relationship with Mexicans and Mexican-Americans here in Texas? A St. Mary's University professor says that camaraderie played important roles in liberation on both sides of the border, though she adds that history about these monumental events is often left out of school curriculums. Devin Clark helps us to fill in the blanks in today's History Untold segment. After the Civil War, St. Mary's history professor Teresa Van Hoy says black Union soldiers helped to liberate Mexico from French control. After the war, they snuck across to Mexico to help Mexicans and Mexican-Americans overthrow the French. As seen from these pictures from the Library of Congress, the aide pointed to a deep-rooted camaraderie. Van Hoy says before slavery ended in America, slaves would flee to Mexico by following trails left in the sand by Mexican wagoneers who traded goods. Enslaved people in Texas were heading for Mexico and freedom. Mexico was freedom, and Mexico protected them the minute they crossed the border. Van Hoy says the relationship angered some white Texans who began killing the Wagoneers. That is until San Antonio Mayor A.A. A. Lockwood stepped in. The mayor of San Antonio protested because the merchants were unhappy because they couldn't get their goods out. History that Van Hoy says is often untold, but should be celebrated to help the nation heal from ongoing biases and disparities. Let's, let's put that on a black plaque. You know, those famous Texas historical markers. Let's let's sing and dance and, and celebrate. One place that houses a wealth of local history is the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum located on North Cherry Street. Right now it's closed due to COVID-19, but there is a website. We have the details on KSAT.com. Reporting on the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio Fire Department arson investigators trying to determine what started a fire inside a dialysis clinic on the northeast side this morning. Firefighters actually getting that call to the 2300 block of Northeast Loop 410 a little before 8. Officials say it looks like the flame started in the clinic, then spread toward the ceiling. Heavy smoke got into the attic, which is shared with the rest of the strip center. The flames didn't spread, though. Employees were coming in for the day when they saw the fire. It doesn't look like any of the businesses were actually open at that time. Let's take a look at time saver traffic here. You can see the camera here at 90 and couples that exit ramp you're looking at. That's the scene of a rollover accident and the vehicle affected there is right in the middle of that exit ramp. That's the, the ramp to General McMullen off of Highway 90 there. So doesn't look like from this view anyway, a big backup caused by that, but certainly the exit ramp to General McMullen shut down now because that vehicle involved in the wreck is right in the middle there. The tow truck on scene, hopefully getting it cleared shortly. Among the hardest hit by COVID-19 have been the very small businesses with little or no revenue to fall back on. Yet now there's six and a half million dollars in federal funds available through a joint effort by Bear County and Lyft Fund. The new grants are divided up among the county's four precincts. Jesse DeGoyato has more about the program that began accepting, accepting applications this week. This colorful outdoor eatery is still making Lala's Gorditas, thanks to its owner getting a loan from the Paycheck Protection Program, money he may not have to fully pay back. It secured my cash flows, secured my payroll, and it was just a 
a relief. But Bear County's new small and micro business COVID-19 grants are much different. It's not a loan that transfers into a grant. It is an outright grant. Janie Barrera with Lift Fund, a community-based lender, says if their annual revenue is a million dollars or less, they could get $10,000 if they have five or fewer employees, up to $25,000 with 10 or less employees. The relief grants, she says, aren't based on credit scores or how much money lost due to COVID-19. Also, they're not awarded on a first-come, first-served basis. What we are doing is trying to reach as many people as possible and giving people the opportunity. The application deadline is June 19th before the grants are awarded on the 29th. This new program uh, gives hope to small businesses. Unsure whether he'll apply this time, Pazzini says relief funds are just what small business owners need right now. They were a lifesaver. You know, it was a lifesaver. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. It feels nice for June 10th. Much better than yesterday. Yeah. See, Myra, you and it's not just because Myra's here. Oh, I was going to say, thanks, Myra comes guys. back from maternity leave and boom, nice and comfortable, beautiful outside. <laughs> yes, all my doing. We could argue you brought us some rain while you were away. Okay, I'll take it, sure. <laughs> See, double whammy. All right, the aquifer is down a little bit today, 1.1 feet, and we're at 668.2, still above average for this time of year and well above stage one restrictions, but it's dropping quickly. Here's your pollen count. Mold and grass, both on the low end, mold with a count of 420. For the most part, temperatures are in the low to mid 90s, 91 at the airport, Tarpley at 90, 91, Divine, Casterville, 93. Tomorrow morning, Get ready for 60s. Some parts of our area, even in the lower 60s, including Bernie and Bulverde. We'll talk about our rain chances and take a look at the lake levels, especially Medina Lake, coming right up. What you see here at Mud Creek has water conservation is fed up. Find out what they're doing tonight. As the number of daily deaths from COVID-19 began to decline, we're getting a better look at the results of studies. Ursula Perry reports Wuhan China research results are helping us here get right to the heart of the matter. Lung and respiratory problems may not be the only concerns doctors have for patients who get coronavirus. If there was evidence for injury to the heart, then the mortality rate was approximately 50%. That said, the death rate was lower than 5% for those who didn't have cardiac injury. So what can people do to protect their heart, even with pre-existing conditions? Exercise is a good way to help your heart and also to lower stress. Stress is a risk factor for heart disease and can increase the likelihood of a heart attack. Also, recent reports have claimed that certain blood pressure medications, such as ACE inhibitors, might influence influence the virus's replication. But Dr. Greenwood does have a warning. You should not stop taking those medications unless directed so by your physician. It's very dangerous to stop taking life-saving medications for patients with high blood pressure or heart disease. And call your doctor immediately if you notice a new symptom or a change in frequency of symptoms. Dr. Greenwood also recommends that those with high blood pressure avoid taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. He says that can raise your blood pressure and put you at risk of heart disease. Instead, he says, just take Tylenol. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look with Sky 12 outside the Bear County Jail where the protesters have moved from the Bear County Courthouse to the jail and uh, continuing their peaceful protests this afternoon. And, you know, in the shade, a good place to be on a day like today. Mm -hmm. All right, so we come back, and Adam's not here. <laughs> and I'm not Welcome used back, to, Myra. I'm not go. used to social distancing on the anchor desk yeah. just quite yet. I know. But different. you're over there. I know. I we see. can look you're, at each you're other. You're far away. You're, okay. Yeah. Hi, Adam. Reminds me of that new Luke Combs song, Six Feet Apart. It's a really good one if you haven't heard oh, it before. Yeah, that it seems is. seems well timed. Okay. It is. It's a good one. All right, so let's talk about our weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's quiet. It's slow right now. But there is a. There's definitely an aspect to it that's going to stick around that I think a lot of us are going to like. So high today was 93 after morning low is 73. Elsewhere across South Texas, we made it into the 90s, but no 100s. That's the nice thing. Think back to Monday when Del Rio was 107. Uh-uh, 
quite a contrast today. About 10 degrees cooler than that. Okay, take a look at the readings out there right now. And for the most part, lower 90s and some upper 80s. Canyon Lake at 88, 89 at Randolph. 89 Rio Medina and 90 even currently in comfort. So overall pretty comfortable out there, you know, relative to June standards, particularly because of the lack of humidity in the air. Remember yesterday at this hour, the cold front was just pushing into San Antonio. And so compared to this time yesterday, our dew point is 30 degrees lower. And you see everybody that had that high humidity east of I-35, we really put a big dent in that dew point and the humidity. That's because of that cool front that moved through yesterday. So behind it, lower humidity and northeasterly breeze and pleasant conditions. I know some of you love the humidity. You'll have your day again. It will come and it'll last for a long time. But this break in the humidity is going to stick around the rest of the week on into the upcoming weekend. And really just the humidity is in no hurry to move back into town. Unfortunately, that means no chance of rain and we could use some showers around here still. It's a good thing we had good rain over the past 30 days, but Medina Lake, it's at 68% full. So that's 15 feet below the conservation pool and six feet lower than just six months ago. Now, earlier this morning, we had a few showers far south of San Antonio and we even had some clouds locally, but that rain really stayed south and even a strong thunderstorm around Catula last night at 10 PM. But now we're locked into this upper level high. It's not a really strong heat high necessarily, but it is going to be the dominant factor in our weather in terms of just keeping us sunny and dry. Yes, of course, a dry high. It's going to hang overhead. Notice as we go through the end of the work week, Thursday, Friday, still close enough to influence our weather, weather Saturday, Sunday, and even on into early next week. And unfortunately, look what that means for our rain chances. Zero percent. I mean, I don't even think there's a prayer at any showers popping up with one exception, and that would be Wednesday along the Gulf Coast. We could have a few of those sea breeze showers developing, but otherwise, no, really not even a ch chance of rain anytime soon. Wall to wall sunshine tomorrow. Comfortable evening right now. It's going to be a beautiful night tomorrow morning right at 65. So sunny and 65, 87 at noon, the 93 the high with that sunshine and low humidity and an east northeasterly breeze at 5 to 10. And this is unusual for this time of year. Usually that southeasterly wind kicks back in, pushes that moisture into town. That's not the case. This is a different type of weather pattern for June where the lack of humidity stays in place all the way through basically the entire seven day forecast. And that's going to lead to some cooler mornings that are running a little below average in the mid 60s and then afternoons in the low to mid 90s. Pretty fantastic for June. Can't beat it. Me. I agree with you. OK, like I always I'm do. Glad. Good to be back. <laughs> Good to be back. Larry, did you see who's back? I did. Welcome back. Thanks, Great Larry. to see you. It's like, it's, you like, it's, it's like we're all back together again. Yes. It's so nice. All right. Things all here. Yeah, and <laughs> some local boys teams got some trophies today. Yes, uh, Wagner boys of basketball team unfortunately didn't get to compete in the state tournament because it was canceled. But today they had a virtual ceremony to honor the Thunderbirds for making it to the 5A state semis. And Cole, the Cougars also honored as well for making it to the 3A state tournament. Coming up. I feel that is going to keep me safe. Coaches are very oh, yeah. persistent on that, keeping us two yards apart, and it's really like, easy to tell two yards since we have a football field. Alamo Heights volleyball player Ruby O'Brien feels safe working out on campus with other student athletes in big board sports. Today, the Wagner boys basketball team was honored by the UIL. With the boys basketball tournament canceled due to COVID-19, the UIL is honoring every state team with a virtual award ceremony. Thunderbirds received a trophy that reads state championships, along with some medals to commemorate their accomplishment. Not playing at the Alamo Dome was a tough blow for Wagner and its 12 seniors who advanced the state for the second straight season and third time in four years. Head coach Rodney Clark got choked up during the Zoom presentation today when talking about those young men. It was hard for me to uh, find words to uh, comfort my guys. Um, and uh, I look forward to watching them next year, you know, in their future endeavors. 
and also uh, from my returners, you know, we're going to work hard, you know, start whenever we can get back in that gym and uh, try to finish the race for next year. UIL also recognized the Cole Cougars who advanced to the Class 3A state tournament. The Cougars got to play their state semifinal, beating Peaster 58 to 44, advancing to face Dallas Madison in the state 3I final. Cole was also presented a trophy that reads state championships. First of all, I'd like to you know definitely thank UIL for everything they've done. Um, I know it's an unfortunate situation that we were put in, um, but. You know, having this and being able to celebrate our guys and their achievements they've had this year is, um, I know it's been, I know it's very important for us. Brandeis will get their virtual ceremony tomorrow at 2 p.m. for advancing to the Class 6A state tournament. Longtime Brackenridge head football coach Willie Hall is calling it a career after this season. Preparing for his 38th and final campaign of coaching has certainly presented him with some new challenges like making sure his players don't get too close to each other. Trying to keep the kids distance, it's, it's a challenge because they haven't seen each other. There ain't just a high five, bump or do something and we, we've got a over and over. It's a, it's an all, all day thing, so until they get it. Outside of that, they, they're working hard. And some of them are, as, as I suspected, they didn't work out as much as they should have and, and uh, the restroom didn't look very good yesterday. Yeah, gonna miss quotes like that from the great Willie Hall. Photog Mark Mendez has been busy this week, stopping by high schools to catch up with head coaches and student athletes. Now that the UIL is allowing voluntary workouts, Alamo Heights volleyball player Ruby O'Brien, like many athletes, is thrilled to be back on campus for strength and conditioning drills. It feels amazing just seeing everybody and like enjoying the fresh air and finally like working out with someone else and not just having to work out on a Google Meet or just like work out virtually. I haven't seen them in a while, probably a few months now, and it's just fun seeing them, like talking with them face to face and just getting more like friendship, connecting with them. 2020 MLB draft is going down right now. Left-handed pitcher Asa Lacey from Kerrville Tybee is expected to go top five. And New Braunfels' Jordan Westberg could be drafted in the first round as well, according to some mock drafts. They haven't decided if they're going to play baseball yet, but they are going to draft baseball players. Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You got be it. Be prepared, right? Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. Powerful moments on Capitol Hill today as George Floyd's brother testifies before Congress. He and the family's attorney vowing to fight in his brother's memory. And as ABC's Alex Pressure reports, the Senate is charting its own path for police reform. Justice has to be served. Today, George Floyd's brother testifying before Congress. You don't do that to a human being. You don't even do that to an animal. His life mattered. All our lives matter. Black Lives Matter. Here at a House Judiciary Committee hearing on police brutality, held just over two weeks after George Floyd's death at the hands of Minneapolis officers. The chairman, Congressman Jerry Nadler, asked Filones Floyd about his brother's death and why he thinks former officer Derek Chauvin, who's facing second degree murder charges, pressed his knee into Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. Chauvin and three other officers charged in the case have not entered pleas. Personally, I think it was personal because they worked at the same place. So for him to do something like that, it had to be premeditated and he wanted to do that. And intentional. Yes, sir. As of now, there is no evidence that Chauvin and Floyd knew each other. The Floyd family attorney, Ben Crump, was also testifying today and used this case to push for more police body cameras. The only reason we know what happened to George Floyd is because it was captured on video. In the Senate, Tim Scott, the lone black Republican, is leading a group developing a police reform proposal. He says it's 90% drafted. Across the country, calls to defund the police have intensified. The idea to take some government funds earmarked for police and redirect them to social programs. Los Angeles announcing major cuts to police funding. Seattle considering a 50% reduction. And New York redirecting funds to youth programs and moving a bill forward that would ban chokeholds. And in Minneapolis, where city council has vowed to eliminate the police department in favor of establishing a new community policing model, the chief of police announced today he is withdrawing from contract negotiations with the department's union. There is nothing more debilitating to a chief from an employment matter perspective that when you have grounds to terminate an officer for misconduct, 
and you're dealing with a third-party mechanism. The Minneapolis Police Department plans to hold an emergency meeting tomorrow to approve a court order for changes to the Minneapolis Police Department and a framework for systemic change. Alex Brache, ABC News, Houston. George Floyd's six-year-old daughter Gianna has an offer of a free scholarship to Texas Southern University. The school announced Gianna's scholarship the same day her father was laid to rest. George Floyd was born in North Carolina, grew up in Houston, later moving to Minneapolis. Floyd graduated from Jack Yates High School, which is right across the street from TSU. Around Texas, a small town city council east of Austin taking a pass on keeping a former Harris County Sheriff's deputy once charged with murder. Now the mayor wants the people who offered her a job to resign. The Somerville police chief not answering questions about Shauna Sheffield, formerly Thompson, or about the call now for his resignation. He left quickly after the city council meeting, which brought protesters who chanted outside as the council discussed Sheffield. Her now ex-husband, Terry Thompson, was convicted of murder in the choking death of John Hernandez outside of a Denny's restaurant in 2017. Sheffield was seen in the video of Thompson on top of Hernandez. She was a Harris County deputy at the time. Last year, a murder charge was dropped against her because of lack of evidence. Six months ago, she got a job as one of three Somerville officers, but when her past was revealed, she was let go. We will continue to go anywhere and everywhere because we don't feel like it's right or that anywhere or anyone is going to be safe as long as she's protected by a badge. Sheffield's attorney says an administrative judge found no misconduct and her peace officer license in Texas is current. He also said she's appealing her termination from the Harris County Sheriff's Office. San Antonio police going to great lengths to catch up with a northwest side man. They said he had mental problems and was armed with a shotgun, including forcing their way into a green belt in the middle of the night. As Katrina Weber reports, officers were getting ready for a standoff in a neighborhood. This place of peaceful serenity was the scene of some tension overnight. Police had to negotiate with that armed man by phone, then navigate through darkness and thick brush to find him. At first, they expected to find him at a home nearby in the 7,000 block of Marshall Pass. Police say that man's mother had called them around 4 this morning, saying he was having some sort of mental crisis, including paranoia and fears about the coronavirus. But when officers arrived, the man had run off armed with a shotgun. They closed in on the neighborhood and searched. Then they reached him by phone and found out he was at the Leon Creek Greenway. Police talked him into sending a signal with his cell phone flashlight so their helicopter could see him. Once he put his weapon down, officers trekked along the dark dirt walkway not far from Bandera Road and brought him out. He was checked out by paramedics, then taken away in a patrol car. Police say it doesn't look like that man who is a military veteran will face any criminal charges. Instead, they plan to detain him for mental evaluation and possible treatment. Reporting from the Northwest Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. If you've been wondering if there was ever going to be another Bill and Ted movie, well, the answer is yes, when it will hit theaters and how long it's been since the two went on a bogus journey still to come. Dude, plus <laughs> how one of the best VFWs in the state of Texas is using video games to recruit the next generation of veterans next at six. VFW 8541 on Austin Highway has more than 1,100 members and was recently ranked the best VFW in Texas. Now the group is staying ahead of the game by shifting towards technology. This Max Massey shows us they hope a new high-tech, high-performance gaming facility will draw in a new generation of vets. My father passed away in 2003, and I got back in 2007, 2008 was my last tour. And so when I went through that hard time, the older veterans here kind of took that spot. For Post Commander Bill Smith, the VFW is a big part of his life. He served three tours overseas, and in his last, he noticed a big change in downtime activity. Halo, Fortnite, Madden 2000. So they played a lot of the different games during their downtime. And so a lot of the newer vets that are coming out or retiring or getting out, they draw to the gaming. He explains the draw to video games as a way to de-stress. It's an escape. It's a chance to 
you know, you're, you're playing with people from all over the world, you're playing with different people, and it kind of gives you that opportunity to get away from what's actually happening. Right now, this room is filled with empty white walls, but soon it'll be filled with high performance gaming consoles. And get this, opening day, 4th of July. 12 to 20 PCs uh, due to COVID-19, we're kind of going to be spacing it out. So we're going to be installing six machines to start with just due to the, the spatial constraints of six foot. But the plan isn't just TVs and video game consoles. Mood lighting with LED strips, something a little bit more modern. Obviously, you're going to have a bunch of displays and, and computers and things like that. But the idea is to kind of, you know, reimagine what the VFW can be. And the high tech facility also includes top tier internet access, something veterans may be lacking. Veterans that come into my cafe already, they're just looking for like solid internet access. You know, they're entrepreneurs and they need, you know, a space to upload or just like a communal workspace. As for the post commander, he sees this becoming more and more popular amongst vets, and he knows it can help get the new generation through the door. The military's got esports teams now, and, and the Army just had, they just announced their. All Army eSports team. So it's, it's, it's huge, and I think it's only going to grow from there. Hopefully all the VFWs at one time will get this. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, really interesting. One. Yeah. Sure. Look outside with live cam, 91 degrees out there. It feels pretty darn good. It was actually pleasant this morning. Yeah, very nice this morning. You know, these are the mornings where you want to take your cup of coffee outside, take in the beautiful conditions, and water the plants a little, you know. Just, oh, I did that this right? morning. Yep. Exactly. I did that as well. It's just so nice to be outside and just take advantage of that weather. And this evening, fantastic. Beautiful evening. Clear sky, temperatures falling through the 80s. Right now we're at 91, but by 10 p.m. we'll be down to 78. And tomorrow morning, mid-60s with that low humidity. We'll talk more about the forecast and even some rain chances coming up. If the words party on dudes and be excellent to each other mean anything to you at all, then you might be susceptible to the buzz that Hollywood is hoping to build for the new Bill and Ted movie. The trailer for Bill and Ted Face the Music is now out. It's the third film featuring Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves as the now middle-aged pals. Now the last movie, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, that came out in 1991. By the way, did you know Alex Winter is from San Antonio? I think he lives in San Antonio. Oh, I did not know or that. Did. I think so. Well, hey, 29 Alex. years gives new meaning to long awaited. The first film, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, was a huge hit in 1989. That dates me, I realize. The sequel, <laughs> not that memorable, and no one seemed to be in a hurry to make a third one. Well, here we are almost 30 years later. Bill and Ted face the music due in theaters in August. Middle-aged pals. I like how they describe that. <laughs> That's nice. Of all the things that get studied in the world today, this one might come as a surprise. When it comes to flamingos, researchers say that the pinker they are, the more aggressive they are over food. Yes, an entire study about flamingos. Well, it was published this week. Yeah, zoologists observed the birds as they foraged for food. They found that the pinker flamingos were more aggressive than the paler, paler rivals. That goes for the males and females. They say that's because the pinker birds were generally healthier. Flamingos get the pigment from the food they eat. And while the birds defer to the pinker kinds when given the space, experts say flamingos exhibit less aggressive behaviors and just spend more time foraging. And now you know. There you go. <laughs> the rest of the story. June 10th is a celebration of an Asian American food creation that so many of us love. Today is National Egg Roll Day. Yeah. There was a groan yeah. over there somewhere. I've missed it. Yeah. Egg rolls started as Chinese American tradition and became part of Vietnamese American fare too. Now over the years, restaurants got creative with different versions of the egg roll. They can be made with pork, shrimp, or cabbage, among other things. According to nationaldaycalendar.com, National Egg Roll Day, founded by a Dallas-based artisan egg roll company owned by a Vietnamese immigrant couple. It was added to the National Day Registry last year. I thought the same thing, Caskey. Artisan egg rolls. <laughs> you had me there. Mm. Yeah, what's that? Oh, about? now he cares about the <laughs> National Day. <laughs> and in Texas, they could be like brisket egg rolls. You could just oh, have and a, that's what, that's oh, where his mind went with it. Yeah, yeah. he care now. You can brisket in anything, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 
Gonna have some brisket tacos on Saturday, mm. actually. Already planning that out. All right, so let's talk about our weather headlines here. Comfortable outside, and that weather is actually going to remain for several days. So this lack of humidity, the crisp, pleasant conditions, especially in the mornings, it's going to stick around. And that will lead to temperatures running below average around sunrise for the morning hours. Although it's going to be sunny and dry. Big Blue H will be in charge, so no chance of rain other than a coastal shower by the middle part of next week. It's a good thing we were in a, a rainy weather pattern. Take a look at this. This is a new graphic that we have, and this is the 30 day percent of normal precipitation. So if we were at 100%, that would mean we were exactly average for the last 30 days. But notice how our entire entire area here is well above average Canyon Lake at 290% of the 30 day precipitation compared to average. And you look at the wider view as well, and uh, we're generally in pretty good shape across South Texas, though obviously we still could use more rain and it would be nice to chip away at the drought that is still particularly southwest of town, uh, closer to Maverick County and even the Carrizo Springs area. But this is nice to see at least our uh, percent of normal precipitation for the last 30 days. It's up. I mean, you're talking 200% uh, in Fredericksburg, so that's twice the average. And it's a good thing we got it because take a look at these rain chances for San Antonio. We've got them down to 0%. As I said before, by Wednesday of next week, there could be a stray coastal shower pop up along the sea breeze, but that would be it. Now, earlier today, we had a few showers develop far south of town, particularly Webb County area. And we had a, a, a few thunderstorms south of town last night, especially at 10 p.m. Catula had a strong storm move through, but now we're just looking at sunshine. It's a different weather pattern. The active weather is all far to the northeast of us. I mean, we're talking the Ohio Valley area. That's where the severe weather is here. Big Blue H upper level high that has settled things down, but this isn't going to be a real aggressive heat high. We're not going to look at a big spike in temperatures or anything, but look at the readings right now for the most part. Lower 90s across Texas, Midland 91, Dallas 88, 91 Junction and Austin here in San Antonio. We're at 91 after a high of 93 at Del Rio at 97. That's noticeably cooler than the, uh, the hundreds that we had there the past couple of days. Here's the big difference. Dew points down in the 40s for most of us, whereas yesterday we had dew points in the 70s and even pushing 80 degrees east of I-35. That's not the case anymore. And this lack of humidity is going to last an unusually long amount of time for this time of year. Usually we'd get a break in the humidity briefly and then the southeasterly wind kicks in and just gives us that resurgence of mugginess. No, that's not going to happen. Our dew points are going to stay in the 40s to near 50. So early tomorrow morning, that's going to mean temperatures in the 60s. Remember, drier air cools off more efficiently at night. 65 in San Antonio, down to 59 in Junction. Fredericksburg at 60 degrees to start the day. And for the most part, mid 60s in and around San Antonio, even uh, Randolph at 64. Then we'll make it into the lower 90s by the afternoon. Wall to wall sunshine, east northeasterly really breeze at 5 to 10. And then we basically put the temperatures on cruise control. The whole forecast is on cruise control. Low humidity, 60s in the mornings, 90s in the afternoons. Sounds good. All right. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Protesters here enter their 12th day of demonstrating in memory of George Floyd. Calls to reform or even defund the San Antonio Police Department continue. SAPD Chief William McManus during a live appearance on KSAT's 6 o'clock news yesterday during our KSAT Q&A said state laws and agreements between departments and the associations that represent their officers allow bad officers to remain on the job. Collective bargaining agreements actually and, and state laws actually protect the bad officer. San Antonio police respond to a shootout overnight on the northeast side. Police say a man in his 20s had just arrived at his grandparents' house when another man in a gray vehicle pulled up, got out, and started shooting. 
Police say the victim was hit in the leg, but then returned fire, possibly hitting the suspect in the process. The victim was taken to the hospital. So far, there is no information from police on any arrests. Well, we have new information on the search for a missing teenager. We first told you about Alexandria Brianna Martinez's disappearance late last month. After two weeks of searching, she has been found. And here's what we know. Martinez was found in Moses Lake, Washington, with 28-year-old Andres Hernandez. He was arrested yesterday on a charge of kidnapping. We spoke to the Moses Lake Police Department, who told us Martinez is back with her family. San Antonio Zoo experiencing a quarantine baby boom. They've had a number of new additions born in captivity while the pandemic forced closures. The births include several animals, such as twin lemurs. Web team's been keeping track of the pandemic with the latest numbers and many efforts underway to help our community through this trying time. It's all online at ksat.com. We're looking at an extended stretch of sunshine. Now, I wish I could say that we'll have a chance of rain, but unfortunately, uh, and it's just going to be sunny and dry every day here. Tomorrow morning at 65, that's to start the day, and you look across South Texas, most of us in the mid-60s. Then by the afternoon, we'll get into the lower 90s with some upper 90s in the typically warmer locations south and west of town. But you'll go into the weekend and even early next week, nothing but sunshine and 90s. Hope to have a KSAT Q&A with Mayor Ron Nurnberg tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Thanks for watching.